Storytelling is important to me because it's literally the oldest human thing. We've been talking to each other and telling us about our lives and about made up stuff forever and ever. It's the best way to communicate. Detroit. 1975. I was an anti-racist. It's five weeks after 9-11, and that means 15 days after the memorial service for my father, who was on the first plane. And her eyes start filling up with tears, because I realize she's in shock, because I'm passing as male, and she has no idea. I really believe that you can't be enemies with someone if you actually sit down and hear them tell their story. I'm speaking to you in Spanish, and you're speaking to me in English. Why? And she says, I thought you were one of them. It's Saturday morning, and my sister and I put on our tackle football gear. Recently, I decided to go on the journey to go find my dad, a man that I hadn't seen in 30 years. The adrenaline is wearing off. I can feel a shooting pain in the side of my ribs. When I was seven years old, my dad was shot three times during an attempted kidnapping. We picked up everything, my family and I, and we immigrated to the U.S. We knew that it was better to be together than apart. When you're listening to another person's story, you kind of get wrapped into what they were feeling, and I, I really enjoy that, and there's not a lot of opportunities to do that with people that you don't know. Are you ready for some storytelling? Hello and welcome to the Stories from the Stage Learning Series. I'm Liz Chang, General Manager of GBH and World Channel and a co-creator of Stories from the Stage. Well, you've told us that you love seeing ordinary people telling extraordinary real stories of love and loss, standing up for a cause, adventures in the everyday, and shocking revelations and even unexpected triumphs. You also love that our multicultural storytellers speak from the heart of their diverse communities and represent every kind of difference. Well, you can always check out worldchannel.org for the season schedule to watch stories based on a theme that's important to you, as well to subscribe to our newsletter and our compelling new Stories from the Stage podcast. That's right. You can listen while driving, shopping, and going to work. And now I'd like to introduce you to someone who has dedicated her career to transformative stories that can make a difference in our lives. Our longtime story coach and friend, the fabulous Cheryl Hamilton. Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for inviting me in that very nice shout out. Um, and thank you to everybody else who's tuning in today. It's so great to spend this afternoon with you for a short period talking about something near and dear to my heart. Um, as Liz said, I've been doing storytelling and speaking for, I was thinking about this morning, since middle school when I first signed up for the speech and debate team. So it's something I do think about a lot. Um, I actually started with speech and debate, continued all the way through college, then went into a profession that enabled me to travel around the country giving presentations and speeches and keynotes. And I stumbled into storytelling about 12 years ago, storytelling in the sense of performative storytelling on stage, sharing personal narratives like we produce here on Stories from the Stage, about 12 years ago when I saw an ad that said, do you have a story to tell? And I was curious, it was a storytelling class. And now I sort of um, spend my time in both worlds, but today we're gonna talk about what is that? Is there really two worlds, two stories versus speeches? Um, you're gonna find out a bit of a spoiler alert that there's a lot of similarities, but there also are some distinct differences. And we're gonna focus on that this afternoon. Um, today we're going to first um, talk about that subject, but also we're going to watch one of the stories recently featured on Stories from the Stage from our Cast Your Vote episode, performed by Eric Brook, who's actually with us backstage and will be joining us for the live Q&A. Um, Eric is a leader in the technology industry. We met through politics, and he's recently also dipped his toe in the storytelling on stage world. And then finally, we're gonna have a live Q&A with all of you. So if you do not have your Q&A uh, feature open, please do. You can use it both to comment, but also to ask questions, whether about tricks about storytelling or speeches, or even to make an observation of like, which do you like more? Which do you feel more comfortable? Or which do you find harder? Um, because they are different in many ways. But let's jump right into this question of what is stories versus speeches? Now. 
the truth is there's particularly as storytelling is becoming more popular, more the buzz, more the conversation piece that I argue that you don't tell many speeches without a story, but there still are sort of two directions you can head. So I'm gonna go through a series of questions just to start sparking your thoughts of like, what do I think the difference is? So let's pull up those questions. The first question, can I picture myself with a friend at a cafe while speaking? Or is there more likely a podium and audience? And what we mean by in the world of storytelling, I often tell people when I'm coaching or working with them, it should sound like you're sitting with a friend, that you're sitting at a bar or a cafe and just sharing an experience from your life. That is, should not only be the style of the writing and the presentation and the tone of voice, whereas a speech doesn't have to always, of course, be behind, behind a podium. I'm someone personally likes to walk around on stage when delivering a speech, but it should have a little bit more formality to it. You wouldn't sit at a coffee shop with your friend and deliver a speech directly at them nonstop for 20 minutes. That would be called monologuing. Um, but we're gonna, that's one thing to consider. The next question that I ask myself when I'm in that tug of war of like, is this a presentation or is this a story? Is, am I inviting an audience to follow me on a journey or am I pointing them in a direction? And I should say that Stories from the Stage focuses entirely on first person narrative. So the lens that I'm bringing to today's conversation is from that place, like our first person narratives. So am I bringing you into my life and taking you with me on a journey? Or am I choosing deliberately stories, facts, arguments, information that I'm hoping will lead you to a certain place by the end of my presentation? The next question that I like to ask when I'm thinking about this is, at the end of the day, is my goal to share an experience in order to form a personal connection, like a really meaningful exchange moment with somebody? Or do I implicitly want to convince somebody to think and act differently? Now, I love that some people have already started using the chat, uh, the QA and sharing some thoughts today. Obviously, in both delivering a story and delivering a speech, you inevitably want to create a connection with your audience. It's incredibly important. But the difference is in this sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation around shared values and shared uh, goal, shared values and shared experiences and reflection, it's still a little different. But the other thing to think about if you're like, which way is this going? Is that, am I spending a greater percentage of my time being vulnerable with the audience, spending time being self-reflective, or do I have to be deliberately making sure that I'm also including in my presentation, in my speech, um, the opportunity to express myself as an expert on a subject or experienced. So that's another thing we think about. Um, the reason we wanted to host this event today is that at Stories from the Stage, we invite anybody, and I mean anybody, to pitch a story to perform on Stories from the Stage. We believe everybody has a story. We all tell them all the time. Whether you're someone who does this full-time professionally as a storyteller, or you're someone that's curious about and wants to enter the craft, we want you to pitch to us. But what we notice is that some people pitch what they believe is a story, but actually sounds like a speech and is a speech that should get out there, some topic that's incredibly important to them they wanna tell people about, or some learning that they have that they wanna share with others. There are so many wonderful places and we're happy to connect people with those opportunities. But for us, we're first person storytelling. We also discover that sometimes someone pitches what sounds like a story, but then when we inquire about it and we get the audio and we listen to it, it actually sounds more like a speech. Now that doesn't mean that you can't participate in the program. It just means we're gonna ask you to think differently, to have less of that call to action and more of the self-reflection and the journey elements together. But we're gonna unpack these more, but what I wanna do is give us some story to work from, to think about and sort of do the comparison with. And so we're gonna share again, Eric Brooks's story from Cast Your Vote about his time uh, running for office in England. It's 2005, and I'm in a pub in North Cornwall. North Cornwall is this bit at the bottom of the UK. It sticks out. This is London. This is Scotland. And I'm in this pub. I'm drinking cider. It tastes good. I love cider. I'm watching the bubbles trail up from the bottom of the glass to the top of the glass. And in the background, there's an argument. The argument's about me and whether I should be a candidate in the upcoming election. 
So a little while ago, Dan Rogerson, a good friend of mine, reached out and said, hey, will you be my campaign manager? I'm going to stand as a parliamentary candidate in the upcoming election. I go, sure, yeah, I'll do that. I can take some time off work and everything else. He also says there's a catch, that there is a county election happening at the same time. So there's 17 candidates for that. So it's 18 candidates that I have to get elected. And I'm thinking, that's a lot, but I like a challenge. OK, Dan, I'm in. So a couple months later, here's me in the pub, listening to the argument, drinking my cider. I love that cider. And Dan stands up and says, I've decided. Eric is going to be the paper candidate. What does a paper candidate mean, you say? Fair question. It means that I'm not intending to win. We're 15 points behind. We have no activists in the area. And so it would be hard to deliver leaflets and everything else. So it's not going to happen. I'm just going to be a paper candidate. We also need it because it's one of the counties with inside Dan's constituency. And we need to make sure Dan is represented in each of those areas. So it started. I'm a candidate. But my main job is to be the campaign manager for those 18 people, including myself. So I tell my friends a couple hours later, you know, oh, this is what's happening. This is where we are. I'm going to be a candidate too. And they go, what? You as a politician? You're having a laugh. Yes, it's OK. I'm not going to win. Oh, but if we come down, we could help you. We could do whatever you think you do is like deliver leaflets and talk to people. We could do that. I said, no, you don't need to do that. I'm not going to win. It's OK that I don't want to win. My friends are not so good at listening to me. So one by one, they start appearing at the local train station. And I come pick them up because it's kind of countryside. Like there's distance with everything. You have to drive everywhere. And eventually in my 200 square foot apartment, I have five people hanging out, sleeping. And every single day they're knocking on doors. They're delivering leaflets to get Dan and I elected. And I say to them, I'm feeling guilty about this. Like, I don't want you working so hard to get me elected. Like, Go out and enjoy the beaches or the Cornish cream teas or some good cider. They don't kind of listen to me and they work hard. So at one point, me and Dan are out in Newquay North. So this area that I am standing is Newquay North. So it's part of the town of Newquay. And we're knocking on doors and people are recognising Dan. That's awesome. We're doing a good job. But they're also starting to recognise me. So occasionally I'm out knocking on doors myself or delivering leaflets and people start telling me their stories. Like whether it be a story about a problem with the local school or a problem about the local bus service being cut. And some grannies need those to get to local shops. They want to walk all the way. So I'm listening to that and thinking, hmm. Now, I'm a software engineer by trade. I love solving problems. And the more complex they get, the more I want to solve them. And there's one occasion that I walk up and knock on a door and hear, come in. And I walk in. And I'm surrounded by grannies. They have all these different types of cakes. And I think, what have I walked into? And then one of the grannies said, oh, you're Eric. You're that candidate for county council. Yep, I am. You could do a cake competition. You could judge which is the best cake. And they all stare at me. And I think, this is a trap. So one by one, I taste each of the cakes. They're great. There's a chocolate one. There's a one with raisins and currants. There's one with cherries. There's one with nuts. I like the crunchy ones. And I say, these are all good qualities. And one of the grannies said, you'll be a great politician. You didn't answer the question, which is the best? And nor shall I, I say. They like me either way, and they say they're going to vote for me. And as I walk from there, I think, wow, God, I love this place. I love the people. I want to solve these problems. So my father, just so you know, he's British, stiff upper lip, you know, tough. My mother, she's Argentinian, flamboyant, artistic, and she falls in love with things hard. And I'm kind of falling in love with Newquay. But no, I have a job back at London. I need to pay off debts. I can't do this, but I kind of want to do it. Months later, we're still campaigning. We finished off. It's now election day and I'm in a gym. Inside the gym, there's 18 election counts going on. Votes have been counted, whether people got the X in the right box or whether it's just outside. People are arguing about, is this a vote for this person or not? I'm paying attention to Dan Rogerson's campaign. I want to make sure that he gets elected. And if I can, get all the other ones elected. Now, I have a good friend, George. George is mischievous. He has a twinkle in his eye. And he sidles up to me and says, it's close. I said, they're all close. They're all looking good. He goes, no, your election's close. 
How close? 40, 50 votes? Oof. But I'm losing, yeah? It's okay, I'm losing. No, you're winning. And I'm thinking, do I want this? Am I good enough for this? The other candidate's good too. Later, George comes back and said it was so close, there's a recount. Huh. I should say, days after the election are surreal. You're exhausted. You've done 16 to 18 hour days. And you're now saying thank you to all the voters. You're saying thank you to the volunteers. You're cleaning up the signs. You're doing the campaign finances. I went to Cornwall to win 18 elections. And we won 17. And one of them, we won by 48 votes. Mine. So I'm staying in Cornwall. I'm going to help those grannies. I'm going to solve their problems as much as I can. And so for the next three years, I work as a politician in a beautiful place in Cornwall called Newquay North. The reason we picked that story for today is because naturally, when we think of people who give a lot of speeches, we think of politicians. We think about people in leadership. Eric has spent a lot of time giving speeches and also discovering the art of storytelling. And so, and so have I. I also come from a background of working on the political campaign and working in that space. And I'll be honest with you, 12 years ago when I started discovering storytelling, being invited to local slams, being invited to events similar to stories from the stage or with the moth or risk or all of these different places, I got some really honest feedback from people. And it was one of the most useful information I got, which was said, you're a little too performative. You sound like you're giving a speech. And I was always like, but I'm standing in front of an audience. Like that's what, that's the tone I use. That's the presentation I get. But when I talked about those five questions at the top of the night, I said that there's things that I always hold myself accountable. And the first one is that when I give a presentation, is it sound like I'm sitting in a cafe or am I sitting in a conference room? The, I wanna bring up a slide with Eric's opening quotes from his story, because I think it's kind of fun that literally his story starts by sitting in a cafe. And the delivery that Eric gives throughout the story is one that I can imagine him telling this with me with a glass of cider together in that pub in England. But I know in my heart that it would sound differently if he was on stage. Now, I'm not saying the whole presentation because you're still going to be yourself and authentic when you're on stage sharing a story. But there's, again, a little bit less of a formality. And there's also a staying in the moment the whole time. And so you want the tone of a story to sound like you're telling a friend and you're not trying to tell a hundred people necessarily at the same time. So that's number one. The thing I like about this quote also, besides the fact that I'm already drawn in by imagining myself sitting with Eric is that he also very quickly presents the conflict in his story. And if you know something about storytelling, you know that a great story needs a really good conflict that's gonna keep us on the edge of our seats. And that conflict can be some external, as I always joke, like some bear chasing you down the street or some internal conflict, like a belief about yourself or a belief about an issue or a struggle you're having, which as we hear in Eric's story is not only like, can he win his seat, which is an external conflict of whether people vote for him, or does he even want it? Like a very personal internal question. The second thing I said that's a question I ask myself when I'm deciding story speech, story speech, is that am I again having an experience that I'm taking the audience on a personal experience with me or am I trying to direct people in a certain way to a certain point or a certain understanding or something that I want them to know? Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up in the world of speech and debate and public speaking classes, I was always drilled into this particular formula. I was told over and over that you tell your audience what you're gonna tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Now, obviously repetition is an incredibly important skill, particularly in the world of speeches. Um, it's very effective. We can look at people like Obama and other amazing orators that use repetition many times to reinforce either through imagery or literally a sentence. But the thing about the tell them, tell them what you told them and tell them again, is that you actually give away your ending. And this is where I said that early on that the difference between a story and a speech is not always very clear cut. In a story, the last thing I'd want you to do is tell me how the ends. I would hate for Eric to tell us that, and I happen to want, win and now tell us a story, right? That would have been very uninteresting to us. We wanna keep in suspense. But I say, when you write a speech, also don't give away your ending. You can tease at it, but if you tell them what you're gonna tell them, 
they've already heard you and they will start to tune out. And so those are one of the ways that I've sort of used the crossover between the two skill sets. But in Eric's speech, I love that he tells us, he brings us into this really wonderful moment. And my favorite part of his soul story is when he's with those grannies. He says, so one by one, I taste each of their cake. They're great. There's the chocolate one. There's the one with the raisins and the currants. There's the ones with the cherries. There's the ones with the nuts. Um, they all have good qualities. And one of the grannies says to me, you'll be a great politician. You didn't even have to answer the question, which one is best? And he says, nor shall I, I say. They like me either way and they say they're gonna vote for me. And as I walk from there, I think, oh God, I love this place. I love the people. I wanna solve their problems. Now that is storytelling and that Eric has brought us into the scene. He's painted this wonderful picture in our minds about who's there, what are the smells, literally in his case, what are the tastes? What's the outcome? If Eric was delivering a speech, now he could use this to reinforce um, whatever the topic is, but it might sound a little differently. For example, let's imagine that Eric was teaching a speech, giving a speech or a training to young aspirational politicians that are asking Eric, so how does canvassing work? Like, what do you do on a campus? He would say, well, here are some things to consider. You wanna connect with your in constituencies. You wanna be authentic. You want to listen to them. You want to be in the moment. You may not want to give away too much, depending on if you don't know which way they're leaning. You want to be affirmative. And then he would use the story. He wouldn't necessarily leave us only with the anecdote. The third thing I think about when I'm choosing, again, this past speech versus story, is that, again, am I doing a connection, a purely human moment and experience where I'm unpacking something I thought about differently or something I had doubt about, a learning transformative moment, or is there a call to action? And this is where when people pitch the stories from the stage or even when they're preparing for their stories to perform on a television show, we see that people have the most trouble because they'll tell a beautiful story and they'll get to the last part of the story and then they'll fall into the trap that all of us did, I did in the early days where it's like, Okay, so what I took away from this experience was, or what I would like you to know about this experience is, which really starts to sound like a speech, because here's the secret to storytelling. If you have presented a really compelling narrative and you've led us into your thoughts and feelings and the dialogue and the action, we're gonna to come to our own conclusion about what this story is about for ourselves and hopefully that it relates to you. It isn't going to have a call to action. Now I know Eric, and we're gonna to talk to him in a second. So I know that one of the reasons he wanted to share this story among many was that he hoped that people would participate in democracy, right? But he didn't end his speech by saying, and so by the way, I also would like you to go out and vote. I would also like you to consider running for your office. He didn't give us a call to action, but a speech would. A speech would have us in some way be inspired to do or think differently. Now, that doesn't mean when you tell a story, you don't implicitly hope that maybe someone would do or think differently. It's just not your driving uh, motivation. For example, I worked for 20 years with refugees. So I do a lot of stories about my interaction with refugees in the world, some of the moments I've shared with people, some of the lessons I've acquired. But when I'm invited to do a storytelling event, I tell a singular or a, a, some event with somebody. Now, when I'm telling it, am I hoping that people might think differently about people who come to this country or might, might I introduce someone to a different cultural perspective? Sure, it's why I chose the story to begin with. But I'm not totally telling a story just to teach people on, here are things you need to know about refugee resettlement in the United States, here's some things you should think about when you integrate people in your community. That's a different event. I love doing those events as well, but there's still a difference at the end of the day. Eric's ending, is one of my favorite endings because again, he fights that tendency to fall into and the moral of my story is, or here's what I want you to take away. Instead, if you remember and listen to it again later, he says, I should say days after elections are surreal. You're exhausted, you've done 16 to 18 hour days and now you're saying thank you to all the voters. You're saying thank you to the volunteers. You're cleaning up the signs, you're doing the campaign finances. I went to Cornwall to win 18 elections and we won 17. And one of them we won by 48 vo votes, mine. So I'm staying in Cornwall. I'm gonna greet those nannies. I'm gonna solve their problems as much as I can. And so for the next three years, I worked as a politician in a beautiful place in Cornwall and Newquay North. 
if you think about Eric's story, we, we learned that he's credible. He was encouraged to run for office. He was asked to run a campaign for 18 different seats, but he's not going on and on about his background. Instead, he spends a disproportionate time because it's storytelling, talking about his insecurities, his doubt about running for office, about his feelings about, should I even do this? Am I wasting my friend's time? If we were giving a speech on the importance of running for office, we might not spend as much time talking about how he didn't even wanna run for office. Instead, you'd focus on how to overcome perhaps some, um, some doubts, but you wouldn't dig deeply into that space as much as he did in this beautiful story. Well, let's bring Eric on screen because I know that he has thoughts about his experience um, and the difference between the two styles. Because when I, uh, let me bring him up. Hey, Eric. <laughs> hey, Shara, how are you doing? So uh, we both love a good backstory. So I'm going to confess to our audience now that actually Eric and I know each other from that particular election. People often ask, how do you get on stories from the stage? And most people pitch to the show directly, which we encourage you to do. But sometimes when we have a particular theme, we go out and look for people that might have, um, obviously if someone's a cast your vote, we were thinking about politicians. Or if we're thinking about Time Out, which was one of our shows we recently filmed, we were looking for sports people. So we're deliberate also in searching people. But you're an interesting backstory because you had somebody who unfortunately had an emergency and we needed to fill in in 30, 72 hours. And I had known Eric from years in politics. I knew he was a great, talk, speak, um, great at speaking. So I reached out and I said, would you consider doing this? Eric, what was your experience like in terms of crafting a story versus working on speeches, which is a place you spend a lot of time? I think stories are real. Um, I think Liz said it, that they have heart. Um, there is um, emotions, all of them, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, it's real. It wasn't something I made up. This actually happened. Um, that probably the Eric that started at the beginning of the journey was different to the Eric at the end of the journey. Um, so I think those equations, those, all of those things kind of come into it. Like, um, yeah, it's real. I think I mean, that's probably the biggest takeaway for me. What did you learn about storytelling through this process? And you had to do it quickly. So what were some of the things you learned and you had to do differently? I think probably one of the things that you mentioned was um, the, the theme, the, the suspense of like, um, cause I'm an engineer, I'm quite direct, I'm quite practical. So sometimes it's skipped to the end, um, but with a story, you don't do that. Um, you have to kind of like delay or, um, um, I want to say the word hide, but the word hide is wrong. It's more that I'm just not gonna tell you that little bit until the very end. So I think that's definitely an important part of it. Um, some people would say in the jokes or humors, it's the punchline almost, it's like, did you or did you not? So the creating the suspense, I think is the thing that you absolutely mentioned. Um, I think sitting with friends is something I naturally do is that's the way I prefer to talk. Um, and talking to people as equals is also how I prefer to talk. So that came, I think, fairly naturally to me. Um, but really, how do I pace the story? Um, how do I actually tell this story? And what are the elements that are important to the story? Um, because there's a lot more to that story, but it's kind of like, here's the edited version of it. So yeah, it was figuring out how to navigate that was part of the journey. Yeah, you had mentioned to me the editing process was, um, you took some tips though from your previous speech writing. What, what, what could you draw from though in the, your, your speech talents? Um, well, what I usually do, I guess, is try to know my audience really well. So like if I'm in, like we obviously did this over Zoom, um, so I didn't get to know my audience very well, but like if I'd been there, I'd have probably tried to talk to people and find out why you're here today. What are you looking for? Um, so understanding the audience and their needs and what they're looking for. Um, the other thing I guess would be, um, again, like um, in a speech is you're paying attention and storytelling to your audience. How are they emotionally reacting to what I'm saying? Um, which words seem more powerful to them than other words. Um, so I think um, paying attention to your audience, which is very hard in Zoom because you're just talking to a camera really, um, and you're not even meant to be looking at the person that you're talking to. Um, so those are a couple of the elements. I think the other thing is 
pacing and practice. Um, I would definitely say that speeches that matter, I practice a lot. Um, and, but I'm also not a person that does a reader script very well. Um, um, I'd be an appalling actor because every single time I would do improv. Um, um, but yeah, there's a lot of connection with improv in that. And that's the way I'd prefer to talk. Well, how are you different? I mean, you started telling speeches. I mean, you were running for president of your university and you've been doing this a lot. How do you do, what have you changed in 20 years? So I have more experience. I've met more humans. I've met more diversity. Um, I've met more cultures. I have spoken different languages. All of that changes how you think about words. I think probably some of the um, biggest changes though were when I started doing improv. So for a little while I did improv um, at Second City and um, Annoyance Theatre, both in Chicago. And there I started to understand more about how to bring people into a story. So specifics, I didn't talk about any cake. I talked about the chocolate cake or the cherry cake. Um, I talked about how I felt about the cake. Um, painting the picture was the words that you used, um, but you paint the picture, but then you also got to talk about something specific um, so that you feel like you're there. I think even when I was talking about the cider, I don't remember um, what I said, but I probably said something like I was watching the bubbles trail up to the top mm -hmm. of the glass. Mm -hmm. um, how do I bring people to almost see from my perspective, through my eyes, my um, things, but also paying attention to that, that's not everyone's perspective. Like sometimes people will be in third person as opposed to first person in their perspective. So yeah, I think improv was probably the biggest change for me. And performing that with lots of people um, it is wonderful and definitely something I would um, think. But I would also say it helped me tell stories better. Yeah. Could I add one more thing? Of course. I think stories add empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think the world needs empathy. Like yeah. we yeah. don't understand everyone's journey, um, everyone's perspectives. And I think if you tell a story about your life or something or someone else's life, it generates empathy mm -hmm. and then builds human connection. And mm -hmm. I think in the world of Zoom and video calling, we need much more empathy. Absolutely. Uh, the next question is, how do you include stories in a speech so that you're sharing a personal experience and want to create an experience for the audience and give a call to action? Where can I get help integrating the two? That's a great question. Um, Eric, do you want to jump in or how do you give me I'll, I'll let you start this time. Yeah, so I'm going to stay in my speech world for a second. Um, one of the things I do is I try not to do too many anecdotes if I'm giving a speech because, again, people can get lost in the stories and excited to entertain and realize that they might have not caught the point every time. It's usually the case that I start with a story. It grabs the audience. I, it allows me to build a personal connection very quickly. I can sneak in some you know, credibility pieces. But then what I do is I reference that story repeatedly throughout the presentation so that I don't lose the story thread, but I also don't lose my goals in my presentation. It's like, remember that thing I told you at the beginning? Here's how it played out later when I'm talking about a particular part. That's one thing I do. Eric? And it actually reminds me of comedy, callbacks. We all love yeah. callbacks. And yeah. I think it's a great technique of bringing in a theme is introducing, and you see a lot of stand-up will often mm -hmm. talk about a story at the beginning and then not tell you how it's connected. And then later on, it becomes revealed, which mm -hmm. is great storytelling just based mm -hmm. in comedy. So I love the idea of callbacks. And if you could do that, I think that really, it reinforces it and it's fun. I also find that um, the best times I use stories when I'm trying to um, give, a, again, a speech, a presentation, a talk, is when I want to illustrate um, something I did wrong in my career or some a moment of learning, right? Where I'm able to be uh, uh, self-deprecating. <laughs> I'm able to uh, show the transformation of learning because that's when people really get entertained. And again, it shows me and it reinforces my credibility on a subject. It's like, listen, I know I did this wrong and I don't want you to do it wrong. So let me tell you about this fun time where something didn't go the way I planned. And here's what I learned from it. I think that's when you can use them well. Um, so, and then people like that. They also don't avoid doing something you did incorrectly. Uh, another question is many story slams have a theme. Does the theme need to be spelled out during the storytelling? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, hinting and having it, the theme come through without saying, and my story is about, or using the exact word 
The first time I competed in a storytelling show was in, here in Boston at Club Passim. Um, uh, and the theme was Genesis. And there were so many different interpretations. And that's why we love storytelling shows. You have no idea how someone is going to go. And I ended up sharing a story about a friend of mine who was trans and had gone through a whole, um, went from being one of my friends uh, who I knew or presented um, as a he, and in fact, as a she, and it was really exciting. And it was a really wonderful experience. So you can do anything. In fact, I actually love the stories that people are less explicit. Like just, we'll, we'll feel it, we'll know if you've hit on the theme. I also wanna say for people that wanna be on stories on the stage, don't let the theme intimidate you. Um, we, if you have a great story and you want to pitch it and you're not sure, go ahead, because as somebody who's behind the scenes, we can sometimes see the lines drawn that you don't see when you're thinking about a story too. So something to consider because we love hearing about some great stories. Eric, um, what, I am curious though, when you were being a campaign manager and you were telling people to go out and give a good speech to your uh, aspiring politicians, what, what did you tell them? Two or three things that you said are must do's when you're presenting. Interestingly enough, I would say, don't talk, listen. Um, and um, I'm trying to think how to appropriately say this. Um, um, my filter is on, um, um, say what you're going to say and then stop talking. Mm -hmm. um, because the point of like those kind of like um, engagements is a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, politicians need to learn from resident citizens and everything else. So listen more, then describe your understanding and then describe how you feel about it. Like, how does it matter to you as an individual? So I would see it as a little less storytelling and a lot more dialogue in that context. That's a great point. In fact, it's also why something else, you know, since I started doing this that I've been much more open to is to share my story and speeches with people before. To be mm. willing to be, uh, have helpful feedback. <laughs> There's many groups out there, storytelling groups that, um, and speech groups that you can work with people, craft something together. Um, it inevitably makes it better. And one of the reasons, particularly if you're going to be someone who's doing speeches and starting to integrate more stories into them is that oftentimes our stories are too close to us. We don't know what people need to know because they haven't, we've walked in our own shoes. And so you really wanna start sharing your uh, material with people in advance because they'll be really supportive and they'll be like, I didn't need to know that part, but I actually don't understand this other section. So being willing and being vulnerable to receive critic, uh, critique is so helpful. Um, and that's, that can sometimes be hard to do at first, um, but it's really, it's why, it's, again, stories from the stage, every single person who performs on the show, whether they have been a storyteller for 20 years or not, um, receives coaching along the process. Um, because, you know, it's an exchange of experience. It's, again, connecting with the audience. Um, we have time for one more question today. What do you think about querying your audience in either speeches or stories, asking them questions during the presentation? Ooh, Eric. I like it because it kind of leans into that dialogue. Um, I think that it can be very nerve wracking to be um, interrupted when you're trying to tell a story, mm -hmm. but I think it's a great opportunity is to pause and see how your story is impacting other people mm -hmm. um, and also understanding the interpretation and people work differently. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if you know your story really well and you've processed all the emotions that's within that story, mm -hmm. pausing is sometimes a good opportunity, but I would say it can be also very hard if you're very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and you see again that in stand up, like sometimes the uh, comedian will put the person down as opposed to rise them up. Right. I would suggest if you have it in you in the moment, rise them up. Um, but I also appreciate, particularly if you're on stage, it's very nerve wracking. So, um, yeah, but listen to it. Ask them so to I, sometimes repeat it. I think um, to reinforce, Eric, what you said about knowing your audience, it's also important to know your, um, I'm going to use producer, for a lot of, less, lack of a better word. Whoever is inviting you to speak, they have, they have a reason that they've invited you specifically. And they've had many years of experience inviting others. They're going to know their audience. They're also going to know what they're hoping that you're going to bring to an event. So you should be asking them, like, is this an audience that I can be proposing a question to, even if it's rhetorical, even if it's just a question that I'm gonna take a few minutes and let them reflect on. I'm not actually asking for verbal responses, but I wanna give them space to consider before I move on. They're gonna tell you and you wanna heed their advice. You can also say, I've tried this elsewhere and see if you can convince people. Um, 
I will say the times that I don't like to be very direct about when people use a story is that it's their opening line and they're like, have you ever felt this way? The truth is that always, almost always, I don't want to make inclusive statements, but most always can be replaced by an actual scene that will remind us of a time that we thought like that, rather than just saying, have you thought or had a moment like this? Um, I know that I did a TED talk, a TEDx talk where I talked about the things that people carry in their suitcases. I asked a question, but I didn't have time in that forum to let them actually answer. But when I do it in schools or I do it with class, um, smaller groups, then I always let people answer. So I, uh, we do have to wrap up, but I will say that the takeaways, Eric, that I took, and maybe you can add one or two is know your audience, know your producers, what they're looking for, know what you want people to take away. And maybe in a storytelling, it's a, it's a particular theme or a lesson or transformation you had, or if it's a speech, it's a particular call to action. Um, again, they can be, they can overlap, but one is driving more in a speech versus a story. Eric? Um, paint the picture really well. Um, not everyone has lived your journey. Not everybody understands the world as you perceive it. Find the specific things that you really want to focus on so that you probably teach them a lot about yourself. So you may be sharing in those. Those are the two I would say is help us come into the story and join you. So thank you for joining us. Um, it's funny, we called it stories versus speeches, but the more and more I thought about it, it's really take the best of storytelling, take the best of speeches and give your pre best presentation would be the thing I would leave you with. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody.